Good afternoon all. Um, a very big welcome to you all to the first of the public health lectures, which is our 20th public health lecture, public lecture at Accra College of Medicine. This is first for the year 2021, and it's our first real COVID uh, lecture also. Um, so I want to welcome you all, and we'll start with a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Our Lord, our God, how great is our name in all the earth. How wonderful it is when brothers and sisters join together with one heart and one mind and to worship you and to serve you. Indeed, we are here all gathered in the name of Jesus. Thanking you for this opportunity. Thank you for a new year. Thank you for the 20th topic um, lecture of the Craft College of Medicine. Yes, Lord, we thank you for having gone through and for us going through COVID. But before COVID was, has been HIV and it's still with us. And there's no vaccine, there's no treatment. So we have come together to have education, also what is going on and what can be done. So we all share ideas and Lord, we are praying therefore be with us and drop into our hearts and our minds that which is good that will solve this HIV problem starting from Accra College of Medicine, Noguchi, Ghana and to the world. So we pray for our brothers and sisters who are yet to come, who are yet to join us. We're praying for good connection, safe travel and our Lord, let everything go on successful. And the end of it all, even starting now, we bless your holy name and give you all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Right. Amen. Thank you very much. It is my singular honor to now introduce the speaker, Dr. George Boating Che of obtained his medical degree from the University of Ghana Medical School. After his internship at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital in Accra, he served as a family physician for three years at Mana Mission Hospital, where he treated hypertension, diabetes, tuberculosis, and HIV. Children with complicated malaria and sickle cell disease and women with complications of pregnancy helping with difficult deliveries and performing cesarean sections. Whilst he was working as a family physician, he earned an MPhil degree from the University of Ghana, where he characterized microbacterial isolates causing tuberculosis in HIV and non-HIV infected patients. He immigrated to the United States of America in 2003 and earned a PhD in molecular genetics and microbiology at the University of New Mexico. Can I kindly ask everybody joining would please mute their microphone. Mute your microphones, please. Subsequently, he moved to Washington University in St. Louis, USA, where he completed his internal medicine residency in infectious diseases and earned a fellowship in postdoctoral studies in HIV pathogenesis. He is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. He returned to Ghana in 2018 and joined the University of Ghana's Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. His research laboratories at Washington and no University of Noguchi, supported by the U.S. National Institutes of Health and the European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, are focused on understanding HIV persistence. Specifically, he is interested in the host factors that enable the virus to persist in patients in the face of antiretroviral therapy and strong immune pressure with the goal to identify and characterize therapeutic targets that will be useful for a cure for HIV. So Dr. Che is going to take us through all of uh, HIV and I will leave him the learning objectives 
uh, that at the end of this, we should be able to explain why a cure for HIV is critical to end the epidemic, to enumerate and discuss the reasons why HIV still has no cure, and to list some of the methods being developed to cure HIV. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And Dr. Che, you now have the floor, please. Thank you. Reverend Prof. Uh, Mrs. Hesse and uh, Reverend Prof. Hesse, and uh, it's a privilege for me to present uh, on this uh, very important topic. And thanks to Accra College of Medicine, I think um, that is a great initiative by my two uh, professors in medical school. So uh, that's wonderful. So um, today I'll be sharing on the progress that we have made towards finding a cure for HIV. Uh, so uh, this is a public lecture, so I'll uh, explain and you know try to make it as um, uh, public friendly uh, as possible. And also, um, I will share some of the work that we are doing uh, here at Noguchi and also in my laboratory uh, at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I'm trying to um, advance my slides here. Okay. How do I go back? Okay, here. Okay, I got it now. I'm not very used to Teams, so forgive me. <laughs> um, so, um, I hope you all can hear me. Um, HIV continues to be a significant uh, health problem. I know now it's all about COVID, but uh, like Reverend said, you know, before COVID there was HIV and probably after COVID there will still be HIV. So um, at the end of, by the end of 2019, 38 million people were living with HIV and new infections stood at 1.7 million and HIV related deaths in 2019 alone was 690,000. So it, is, it still remains a very relevant um, public health issue, which we have to contend with. That said, you know, antiretroviral therapy or ART has made a huge difference. As of now, up to 70% of all people infected with HIV are on antiretroviral therapy. In Africa, the number stands at around 65%. In Ghana, according to the Ghana AIDS Commission, the number on antiretroviral therapy is anywhere from 60 to 70%. So that's around 65%. So that is good, but that also means that about 30% of people are not on any medication, which you know, is a problem. Now, the good thing about antiretroviral therapy is that it is able to control the virus. When people take their medicines, they are able to control the virus to where if you check for the viral RNA in the blood, you will not find it. We say that they are controlled to the point where it is undetectable. It doesn't mean they don't have HIV anymore. It just means that by the tools that we are currently using, we are unable to detect it. So that is where we want to be. We want the person taking the medicine for the medicine to be so effective that when we check for the virus, we will say that it is undetectable. However, antiretroviral therapy 
does not get rid of the virus. So what it does is that it controls the virus to the point where it's undetectable. So if you look at this graph, if you have a patient that I see in the clinic who has a very high viral load, sometimes in the millions, copies per mil, if I give the person antiretroviral therapy, for instance, um, usually within two to six weeks, the person's virus will be below the limit of detection in the blood. So that is actually pretty good. And it can stay like this for as long, for years, as long as the person is taking their medication. Now, previously, this medication that I represented here by one pill was many, many pills taken multiple times a day. But now, most patients are able to go on one pill once a day in many parts of the world, or a couple of pills um, uh, taken once a day. So that is pretty good. You know, like we say, most people, most adults who are over 40 are on some kind of, you know, <laughs> medication or the other, either something for hypertension, diabetes, you know, something else, you know. So taking one pill once a day to control the virus completely is not that bad of a deal. And a lot of HIV patients are now living pretty normal lifespan uh, in most places. So the antiretroviral therapies are actually pretty good. However, if the patient were to stop their medication for any reason, what happens is that the viral load goes right back up. Usually within two weeks, three weeks, you know, they are back to where it's as if we didn't even treat them. You know, so that is the problem with HIV, is that as soon as, you know, the person stops their medication for one reason or the other, the virus just comes back up and begins to, you know, deplete the CD4 cells and cause all the complications that can come with uncontrolled HIV. So unlike, let's say, the flu where, like, you get rid of it and it's gone, or even COVID that you get, you know, and it's, you know, pretty much gone, or you get a pneumonia and you are treated. For HIV, when you stop the medication, the virus just comes back up. That means that patients must be diligent in taking their medication for the rest of their lives. So they must take their medication for the rest of their lives. Otherwise, if they stopped, you know, the virus just will come back. So, from what I've said then, is a cure really needed? You know, if the person, oh, somebody has started sharing and ended my presentation. <laughs> um, please, whoever was sharing, is sharing a screen should stop. Anthony, or whoever, Anthony, you are sharing your screen. Okay, IT, can you help, please? Just hold a minute, we'll try and see what uh, is going on. Right. Um, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, I need to share yeah. my screen again, I guess. Um,
Bear with me, I have to share my screen again. All right. Right, so from what I've said so far, the question is whether a cure is really needed. And there are a number of reasons why a cure is needed. That's why the fact that the current antiretroviral therapies are very effective. The first is that, you know, patients have to take these medicines every day. And when you have to take medicines every day, most people get tired along the way. And because of that, a lot of patients sometimes are not consistent with taking their medications. What that is doing in Africa is that there is now um, a huge problem that is coming up, which is the emergence of resistance. So drug resistance is now becoming a huge issue, as you can see with these articles here on the left. So that is going to be a problem. And some of us are worried that it's going to be what you call a second HIV epidemic, which is going to be a resistance epidemic. Because um, you know, people are not the only reason why resistance develops is when people are not consistent with taking their medications. So that is one reason why we really need a cure. Another reason is the cost. So the, um, as at uh, last year, um, as at 2015, you know, the, the world has spent $301 billion on treating HIV. Now, for those of us in the developing world, most of the cost of treatment is borne by donors. And we've all heard recently where some of the donors are getting tired. You know, there's donor fatigue. How long can they keep supporting treatment of HIV in Africa? Remember, 67 to 70% of patients with HIV live in Africa. So if the donors stop, you know, that means that you know, there's not going to be, you know, enough antiretroviral therapy to go around. So that is another big issue. The other issue is side effects of these medications. You know, the medication that we use uh, recently have been pretty safe, but then there are, um, there are issues that are now coming up. For instance, one of the medications we use is called uh, integrase inhibitors, which you know, about a few years ago when they came up, when some of us, when I was doing my fellowship, for instance, we really loved that medication because patients didn't complain, you know, it was pretty good. But now we are learning that, you know, it can even cause uh, neural tube defects for women, you know, who um, are pregnant in the, in, the, in, the, in the babies. It can cause other neuropsychiatric, you know, effects. So, Drugs do have, taking drugs for a long time, you know, can cause side effects that are not desirable. So if you put all this together, you know, it shows that we do need uh, a cure for uh, HIV. So why is it that we do not have a cure for HIV? We have a cure for a lot of infections. HIV has, has been around for 30, over 35 years. We do have uh, effective treatment but we don't have a cure. And I'm gonna list a few reasons why. The first one is that is the life cycle of the virus. The life cycle of the virus inherently favor persistence. Now this cartoon that I've drawn here shows the HIV virus entering the cell. Uh, as you can see, the virus enters the cell by binding to a receptor called a CD4 and a co-receptor, uh, which we call CCR5 or CXCR4. Once it enters, it integrates itself into the genome 
of the into the genome of the person's uh, cells, uh, T cells. Now, before you know, it makes copies of itself, which then comes out to infect other cells. Now, so here is a problem. The T cells that the virus is able to integrate in, some of these T cells are long lived T cells. They are the cells that live in your body pretty much for the rest of your life. So if the virus, you know, um, if the virus for some reason integrates in these long lived T cells, then that means that you know, the virus is also going to live in your body, you know, for the rest of your life. So that is one of the huge issues that, you know, HIV presents is that this life cycle makes sure that it integrates into the cells that live in your body in the long term. And these cells mainly are what you call the resting CD4 T cells. There are multiple types of these resting CD4 T cells. And these T cells are the cells that usually, they, uh, when you get any type of infection, the infection is fought by these T cells. And some of these T cells develop memory and then they live in your lymph nodes and other places for the rest of your life so that should you get the same infection another time, they will come back strongly to fight the infection very quickly. So these cells, if they are infected with HIV, that, that means that that virus is going to live also in your system uh, for the rest uh, of your life. So that is the key reason why, because the virus infects long-lived cells in uh, our bodies. The other problem is that because of these long-lived cells, the virus, the amount of total amount of virus in a person's body decays slowly over time. So this is a graph that is showing uh, these um, eight patients that were followed for 200 uh, weeks. And you can see that uh, if you take for each patient, the amount of virus is shown on the y-axis. The amount of virus in the particular patient does not decay that much. You know, if you take, let's say this patient, it just remains like this. For each particular patient, although they have different baseline, um, the uh, amount of virus in the body remains pretty much, you know, constant. Now, models have shown that for each patient who is on antiretroviral therapy, whose virus is undetectable, if they keep taking the antiretroviral therapy, it will take 70 years for their virus to decay to where there is not virus in their body. What that means is basically beyond the lifespan of the person. So, so long as, you know, if you get an H HIV at 20 years, uh, obviously, if it is going to take 70 years of antiretroviral therapy to reduce your viral reservoir to where it is, you know, it won't come back, then it's not that useful. So that, you know, is a problem. So the problem is that HIV infects the T cells, which naturally in your body are going to live as long as you live. So then if the virus is infecting these cells, is there any hope that we can cure HIV? You know, how do we get rid of HIV in this resting CD4 T cells uh, without, you know, um, without affecting all the other T cells in our body? And there have been glimpses of hope that has assured researchers that we should keep working on this problem. The first one, I'm sure some of you have heard about the Berlin patient and recently the London patient. So the Berlin patient shown here, Timothy Brown, who um, had, he was an HIV patient who developed um, leukemia, which is a bone marrow cancer. And he had 
stem cell transplantation as treatment for his cancer. But the doctors who did the transplantation used a donor who had a mutation in the, the, the co-receptor for the HIV. Now, that is called a CCR5. Without the CCR5, the person cannot be infected with HIV. Now, there is about a small number of Europeans who have a mutation in this gene. And those people cannot get HIV because the virus needs that receptor to enter the cells. So what they did was that they took, um, they took stem cells from the bone marrow of a person with this mutation and give it to this patient. And the persons, all of the person's um, cells were replaced. Blood cells were replaced with this with a new donor. And therefore the person, Timothy Brown's now new cells were not susceptible to HIV. Now he lived over 10 years without um, the HIV coming back. So he was actually the first true person who was cured, truly cured of HIV. He recently died from complication of his leukemia, not from uh, HIV. And recently another patient that we call the London patient has undergone the same procedure. Now the problem is that this procedure is not something you can do for everybody. It is only for people who have a cancer that needs aggressive treatment because the treatment is so aggressive and so toxic that even some people die from the treatment itself. So this is not something that can be applied generally, but it shows us some of the ways that we could use to uh, overcome HIV. The next glimpse of hope was what we call the Mississippi baby. So this was, a baby who was born by a mom who did not go to antenatal. Uh, and yes, there are some uh, people in the US who also don't go to antenatal. So this was Mississippi in the USA. So uh, she did not go for antenatal care and showed up for delivery and was found to be HIV positive. Now, when the baby, when they delivered the baby, they tested and found the baby was positive. So they started the baby on a three drug regimen, which was actually very aggressive. That is not the usual regimen, but the doctor for some reason started this regimen and they put the, put the baby on this regimen for about a year or so. And then the mother was lost to follow up. Mother and baby were lost to follow up. So they didn't show up for like, almost two years, 18 months. And when they came back, they had not taken any antiretroviral medication for that long. And yet the baby was still negative for HIV. So what that showed was that if you started treatment very early for people who are infected with HIV, it's possible that the virus can be controlled for a long time. Now, eventually the baby uh, rebound, HIV rebounded and had to be restarted on medication. Now, this principle has also been used to treat a group of French, uh, a French patients who HIV was treated very quickly after they got it. And some of them have lived for eight years without needing any medications. So this shows that you know, if you treat HIV very quickly, once it's acquired, you may be able to control the virus. But again, this is also not a very practical way, just because for most people, by the time we get to know that they have HIV, it's been years and their reservoir size has been seeded for a long time and they have a lot of reservoir in their body. And so this method uh, will, not, will not work. So how will an HIV cure look like? Now, the best cure is what we call eradication cure. Uh, some people call it sterilizing cure. But basically, you completely remove the virus from the body, such so that you know, you know that the person doesn't have the virus anymore. But that may not really be what comes on board in the near future. What we are more likely to get is what you call a functional cure. 
A functional cure is where you have reduced the person's reservoir of HIV in their body to a very low level that even if you stop the medications, the virus will not come back. Or if it will come back at all, it will take many, many, many years to come back. So that is what we call a functional cure. And some people also have talked about the hybrid cure, where you, know, you reduce the reservoir uh, due to you realize the virus that you know your immune system is not able to control the rest uh, of the virus. So we will talk more about this uh, later on. So what are the cure strategies that researchers are working on? So if you can imagine this, so you have the virus in these resting T cells. Now these T cells, for the most part are uh, just sitting there. They are not multiplying. They are not multiplying because they have not seen the antigen that they need to multiply. So let's say if you get the flu and your body makes memory T cells against the flu and those T cells for some reason have HIV in them, until you get another flu, those T cells are not going to multiply and produce the HIV. So how then do you get rid of these cells that are, have the HIV. Now, the good thing is that if you take a million, you know, resting T cells, only about one or two of them, or maybe a maximum of five of them are going to have HIV integrated in them. So it's not all of your T cells. It's a, the vast minority of your T cells that has HIV uh, integrated, which is a good thing. So what is the other the strategy? So I'll talk about four strategies that uh, researchers are working on. The first one is what you call the shock and kill approach. This is the most studied approach. And here is the idea. So you have your T cell here and you have your HIV integrated into it. Like I said, these T cells are resting CD4 T cells. They are just sitting there. So then what you do is that whilst the person on, is on antiretroviral therapy, you give the person another agent that we call a latency reversing agent. That will go and basically reactivate the HIV in the person's cells. Now, because the person is on antiretroviral therapy, if those T cells begin to produce HIV, the virus that comes out will not be able to infect the surrounding cells. But usually when T cells begin to produce a lot of HIV, they die off or they are seen by the immune system and the immune system kills them. So the idea is that if you give these LRAs, then over time, you activate these resting T cells to the point where you know, all of them that have HIV will be killed either by the immune system or by what you call the viral cytopathic effect or virus mediated cytotoxicity. So if that does happen, then over time we can stop the latency reversing agent, but because now the person has no HIV T cells in them, you can also stop their antiretroviral therapy. So this is the idea. Now, like most ideas, you know, it is easier said than done. But this is the one that has received the most uh, um, work. And there have been a number of clinical trials, uh, most of which have been disappointing, mainly because it looks like we are not able to reactivate enough of the resting T cells uh, to be able to get rid of them. So in our own laboratory, what we did was that we wanted to find latency reversing agents that would be more effective. That would be better than the ones that we have on the market. So what we've done in a number of studies is that we've identified these new latency reversing agents. So this is, here we have some cells that we have artificially infected with HIV and those, that HIV is latent, and we can um, activate those cells to produce HIV. So 
the drugs that will be able to produce the most HIV is the best latency reversing agent. So the TNF you see here is uh, what you call a positive control. That is the one that works in these particular cells, but that one you cannot use in patients because it's toxic. So here you can see that we have at least three compounds here, two, three compounds here that we have discovered that um, as at the time we published it, they were the most effective latency reversing agents uh, that has ever been reported. And now what we are doing is we are trying to get this into mouse studies and eventually uh, into people. The next strategy I will talk about is what we call the block and lock approach. Now this is somehow like opposite of the shock and kill. Now we have the HIV that is integrated into the person's resting CD4 T cells. So the idea behind this is, now what if you could potentially lock the virus permanently into those T cells so that they never uh, have to come out and multiply again. Now, this is not far-fetched. Now, if you look at the human genome, now HIV is a retrovirus. The human genome has about 8%, 8 about 8% 8 of our human genome is made up of retroviruses, which we have acquired you know, over time in evolution. So, but the only reason why some of those retroviruses are not causing trouble for us is because the surrounding genes silence them. The, sur the surrounding chromatin, the surrounding proteins silence those retroviruses. So what if you can find a way to silence these, this HIV in people so that if you stop their antiretroviral therapy, they will not be able to produce any HIV. And a lot of work is going on here. Uh, recently, one group published a compound called DCA that is able to prevent HIV from getting reactivated. And in our own uh, laboratory, we have uh, discovered uh, another pathway. We discovered a compound that when we use this compound, it blocks a protein called SF3B1. And we are able to show that, you know, whilst if you have TNF alpha, you can actually produce a lot of HIV from the latent T cells. When you add our compound, you, are, you completely block this, um, this uh, reactivation of the virus. And we are now uh, discovering the chromatin mechanisms that may enable us to completely lock the virus into the genome. Now, some people may say, you know, <laughs> you have locked the HIV into my genome, you know, uh, is that going to cause any trouble? Um, we don't think it will cause any trouble. So long as the virus is not multiplying, I think the person, the person should be fine. The other strategy that we are using is called uh, gene therapy. I already talked about transplantation, which is not feasible for most people, but there's gene therapy. And for that, that is potentially feasible. So that one, for instance, if we take a person with HIV, we take a lot of CD, uh, stem cells from their blood, and then we remove in the lab the co-receptor for the HIV, the CCR5, using various gene editing methods that I won't go into. If anybody wants to ask in the question session, I can go into that. And then now that those cells in the lab from the person are resistant to HIV, we put those cells back into the person. And because they are stem cells over time, they can take over the person's uh, blood cells. And then the person will become resistant to HIV. So this is an approach that uh, a couple of clinical trials have been done on. And it shows that it is potentially feasible. The only problem, obviously, is that you can see that this will require a lot of very high-tech equipment, unlike the shock and kill and block and lock, where 
you can just give the person another pill or another medication. So that may be the problem on trying to make this in a large scale. The other strategy, the last one I'll talk about is what you call immune-based cure therapies. And personally, I think this will probably be the first one that comes on the market and be used in patients. There are a lot of monoclonal antibodies against HIV that have been made. And as you can see here, over the past you know, 10 years or so, there have been a huge number of monoclonal antibodies that have been approved for use in people. And the idea here is that after you give the person antiretroviral therapy and their virus is undetectable, then you can give them possibly what we call therapeutic vaccination. So you put this vaccine in them that will produce anti-HIV um, antibodies for the rest of their lives. And then whenever the virus, the reservoir virus be, tries to come up, you know, the antibodies will get rid of them. Now here, what I'm showing here is a monkey study. So this one is not a study in people, but it's a monkey study. But um, what they did was that they infected these monkeys with the monkey version of HIV that we call SIV. And then they gave them antiretroviral therapy for a while. And then in this phase, they stopped the antiretroviral therapy and gave them these monoclonal antibodies and stop the monoclonal antibodies as well. Now, so from all of here, there's no monoclonal antibodies, but the virus is completely suppressed. Whereas the, the virus that did not get um, the monoclonal antibodies came right back up. You know? So this is an approach that is being seriously studied. And I think this will probably be the first one uh, to come uh, on the market. So basically the idea is we will take our patients whose virus are suppressed and then we we'll give them a shot um, of a, what you call a therapeutic vaccine, which will control their virus for, for the rest of their lives. So cure approaches, scalability and ethical considerations. So there are a few ethical considerations here. As you can see, these patients are currently not doing that bad. You know, this is not cancer, okay? So if you are going to um, give them, you know, a medication to cure their HIV, or you're going to do some procedure to cure their HIV, it should be something that is pretty benign. It, should not, it shouldn't be something that is so out there, you know, that it makes the patient miserable or it causes damage. So that is one of the main things that we think about uh, in this. So if you take the shock and kill and the block and lock approaches, we say that the risk is medium. The risk is medium because, you know, you are just giving the person another pill, which has probably gone through other clinical trials. However, if you take gene you know, manipulations, we are not sure what will happen in the long term. The long term effect is not known. Um, if you take stem cell transplant, like I said, that one is not even, uh, you can't do that for everybody. The immune-based therapies, I think the risks are low. And uh, again, that is what is likely to come on the market. It is also scalable in that you can give antibodies to millions of people. Or, and the shock and kill is also scalable. You can give, you know, you can deploy those, can, those two uh, approaches in, in a place like Africa, uh, where there's a lot of people with HIV. So what do patients think about all, all of this? You know, sometimes we researchers, we get carried away and we want to do all kinds of cool things. But at the end of the day, it's the patients that we are going to do the clinical trials on you know, what do they think about all of these risks? So one of the things that every HIV cure trial will do 
is what we call analytical treatment interruption. Basically, what that means is you ask the patient to stop their antiretroviral therapy to see whether what you think is a cure is really a cure, right? So let's say you give them whatever intervention you have given, let's say your antibodies, and then you say, that, okay, stop your antiretroviral therapy every two weeks or every month, come, let's check your virus to see if your virus has come back up. Okay, so that is asking people to stop their medication. Now there's the risk that some of these, the virus may rebound. There's the risk that the virus may rebound and they may give it to their partners. You know, so it is not a benign, you know, intervention. So we call it ATI. Now in st small studies that have been done in Europe and the USA, about 60% of patients are willing to undergo ATI for cure studies, for cure clinical trials, okay? But these things have not been studied in Africa. So we did one study here in Ghana last year, and that is what is shown here. And we re recently published this, um, led by one of my colleagues, um, Evelyn Bonney. You can see here that when we ask our patient in the C, here we ask our patients, would they be willing to stop the antiretroviral therapy for HIV cure trials when they are closely monitored by their physician? 67% said no, you know, and 17% said maybe. Only 13% said yes, compared to 60% in the European uh, studies. So this is, uh, very interesting, but it also shows that there may be cultural differences in people's risk tolerance. And people are willing to undergo simple studies like questionnaires and blood draws, but when it comes to like block and lock, shock and kill and so on, you can see that the number of people who are willing to engage in those come down significantly. Um, also often, these cure studies, we need to take a lot of blood from patients. Often we need to take about, you know, 100 mils or even up to 200 mils of blood at a, at a go. And when we ask patients, you know, whether they will be, how much blood they'll be willing to donate, um, most people just wanted to donate less than a quarter pint, which is less than 100 mils. A quarter pint is about 100 mils, which um, and a half pint is about, you know, 200 mil. So at least we have about 30% of patients willing to, to sacrifice for this, uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of studies. So the bottom line is we need to study more what these patients think about these cure trials. And we did some qualitative studies that we are now analyzing to look at why patients are so resistant to stopping their medications for cure studies. And I think for us, it, it looks for our patients, it looks like it has to do with their experience. They've seen people who stopped their medication and went to a herbalist or went somewhere else and something bad happened. You know, as you can see here, one said two friends of mine have passed on nine months apart because they stopped their medications and went on a so-called you know, cure. Another person said, you know, he is willing to engage in HIV cure trials, but the boundary will be we ask him to stop taking his medications. You know, so we need to study this more in the African context because the trials are coming. And when they come, we need to participate in those trials in Africa since most HIV is in Africa anyway. So these are my closing thoughts. So HIV cure is definitely desirable and efforts are being made in that direction. And we are doing our part um, here at the University of Ghana. Uh, I've talked about the shock and kill, block and lock, immune therapies. And these are the ones that I think are more suitable in the African context. We should talk to patients more to look at their views so that we can um, incorporate their views into these up and coming trials. Um, often, you know, we in Africa, we don't want to participate in the trials where we want to benefit from the, 
you know, the outcomes as we've seen recently in the COVID. But I think that we have to educate our patients, educate ourselves, educate our healthcare workers so that, you know, we can all participate uh, to end HIV. But in the meantime, whilst we are working hard to get rid of the virus, I think that what we can do is to make sure that everybody who is infected is on antiretroviral therapy and their virus is controlled. Recently, it's been shown that undetectable equals untransmittable. What that means is that if somebody's virus is undetectable on ART, that person is unable to transmit the virus to other people. You can imagine that means if you are able to get everybody uh, who has HIV on ART and their virus is undetectable, that in itself will over time end the, you know, the HIV pandemic. So uh, that is something that I think in the meantime, we need to work on very hard so that we can get as many people as possible on treatment, which will stem the tide of transmission. And I would like to thank uh, all the people that have been involved in this work. My lab at Washington University, uh, my PI collaborators, and the massive action team here at uh, Noguchi, and also the funding sources uh, from the Washington University, the NIH, Robert Louis Johnson Foundation, and the EDCTP. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I will hand over to the moderator for questions. Thank you. Right, very good. I wish we could show appreciation uh, by wherever we are clapping. We did. Uh -huh. I did. Thank you very much. Madam President, please take over. Please carry on. You are doing well. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Right, so um, we are ready for questions. You can uh, either um, show your hand uh, on on the board up top, or or put it in the chat. Again, the chat is uh, symbol on top. And then uh, we would ask you to to either speak or call you to speak. Shock and kill, block and lock, and immune therapy but this is specific immune therapy not general immune therapy i presume yes this is uh, vaccination in to treat vaccination as a treatment correct correct so what will what this will do is that it's like you, you receive a vaccine but the vaccine has what you call a vector that will perpetually produce the antibody. So anytime the virus tries to raise head, the antibody will just get rid of it. So the antibody is specific anti-HIV antibodies. Yeah. There's a question on chat. How do you think we can impress on Ghanaians to get involved in trials? <laughs> yes, that is a million dollar question. I think that education, education, education is the is the is the thing. And also the education is not only, you know, um, educating healthcare workers and the general public, but even our politicians, you know, because if you remember the Ebola thing that happened in 2016, <laughs> you know. That was a huge blow to research in Ghana, and um, a lot of it was mainly, um, you know, politicians stepping into research and doing things that shouldn't be done. So I think that we scientists also need to lobby parliament, for instance, you know, 
uh, I'm not sure the University of Ghana, for instance, has like a lobbying team in parliament. I think these are things that we have to do. This is done in other places where scientists and scientific bodies, you know, like the American Medical Association has a whole lobbying crew at the US Congress. You know, these are things that we have to be doing because at the end of the day, you know, if the politicians don't buy into some of these things, it won't happen. Or if their constituents tell them things that, you know, they don't want, then it won't happen. So the education goes all around. I think um, that is how we can all, uh, and we have to educate people that, you know, trials are trials and often these are very well vetted by the FDA, by the institutional review boards. So it's not like people just get up, you know, and and do trials. So I think education is the main thing we can do. Dr. Collins, Obua, please. Okay, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question in the, the two mechanisms that you gave the um, shock and kill and the block and lock. We were talking about so, uh, some compounds, of course, as a chemist, I'd like to know if you would like to disclose some of these compounds that, you were, that were used in these two mechanisms. Yes, I'm happy to do that. And they've all been published also. So the, for the shock and kill, the one that we uh, has been used for the most part is the histone deacetylase inhibitors. And the histone deacetylase inhibitors, as you know, they are able to unwind the winded chromatin and therefore enables the virus to be transcribed. So the one that we showed uh, are what we call isoform specific histone deacetylase inhibitors. And those seem to be more effective than the ones that are already on the market, which usually are what we call non-specific, you know, iso uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors. So for the shock and kill, that is the one. For the um, for the block and lock, the one that we discovered is the is pseudomycin D6, and they are compounds that were initially isolated from uh, marine cyanobacteria, and they belong to a group of compounds called the palladonites. So um, I'm sure. Uh, as a chemist, you can go to town and then look into those. Uh, but that, that, I think, is the answer to your question. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, because we have been doing a couple of um, compounds. These, uh, these uh, compounds are actually uh, metal-based, like the, uh, what do you call it, uh, gold-based and, and platinum-based compounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for these these two kind of mechanisms. That's why I was trying to find out if you also are also made okay. uh, gold or platinum base. Of course, you know, with the cancers, we have the platinum being one of the good ones. Yeah. There, but we are researching into the gold and cancer, uh, the platinum for it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. And if you have any compounds, we'll be happy to test them in our lab for you. For no problem. I'll, yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll get in touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Dr. Fred Nanapuku, please. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate the organizers and the presenter, Dr. Che. My little question is on the, the, the vaccine on treatment. I'm just wondering how different this vaccine will be compared to the vaccine that could have been given without treatment. We, are, we know that we are looking at virus suppression and then we give the vaccine uh, to ensure that the vaccine affects any viruses that will want to rebound from the suppression. Um, we know the viruses are able to change the genome that is making uh, the production of vaccine very difficult. So I'm just wondering how different this one will be from the normal vaccine that we might have 
produce uh, without the treatment. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, that's a very good question. So the, most of you may know that HIV, we've been trying to produce a vaccine for HIV now for years. Uh, without success because of the envelope is able to mutate pretty pretty rapidly and so um, it has made it very difficult to produce a, a good vaccine now that is why now there is a lot of emphasis on making these uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies and the it has been shown now that a combination of a couple or uh, maybe three of these broadly neutralizing antibodies is able to really keep the virus in check. Now, when you give the vaccine, when the person doesn't have the virus, if they do come across a particular um, a particular virus that is not sensitive to the vaccine, then of course it's not going to work. Now, what has been shown is that for people who have been completely suppressed, often they don't have a lot of diversity in their virus. So for instance, when we have patients who um, stop their medication after suppression, what comes out usually is the same one that was there before. So the idea is that if you are able to have a few really, really good broadly neutralizing antibodies after the person has been suppressed, and remember, this is also not um, a vaccine that you give and hope that you know the immune system produces. This one will be one that will be constantly being produced. And so that kind of vaccine always has an overwhelming amount of antibodies that will be able to control the virus. That will be coming in small quantities. Remember, these reservoirs are not producing virus in large quantities. Usually it's a few T cells here and there producing the virus. So that one you'll be able to control, to control. The monkey studies have so far been very promising. So we'll see, again, we'll see what happens uh, in the you know, human studies. And there's a lot of clinical trials now going on. Uh, there are over 300 of them. Uh, most of them are in phase one and two. So when they get to phase three, I think that is when we will uh, begin to participate. Thank you. Right, thank you too. Anthony, please. I'm seeing me. If Anthony is uh, his lowest hand, um, Nikwaku, please. Nikoku, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to find out about the HDAX, um, HDAX, and I wanted to know whether the inhibitors are specific for the viral genome or these are broad acting HDAX if they don't affect um, normal genomes. Yes, that's a very good question. So the histone deacetylase inhibitors are not specific for HIV. So they are broad. The one that has been most used is Vorinostat, which is what you call a pan HDAC, which basically means it affects all of the HDACs. You know, there are multiple HDAC groups and classes, and what the research has shown is that HIV really only uses the class one HDAX, and even the class one, HDAC one, two, and three seem to be the most important. So that is why, for instance, in our study, we were trying to discover isoform specific HDAX, although the isoform specific ones may not be specifically for where HIV is integrated, but at least they will not be broad 
to affect all kinds of cells. So the answer to your question is no, they are not you know, specific for the HIV genome. They can affect other parts of the genome, which obviously can lead to some side effects. Although even Vorinostat doesn't have, Vorinostat is used in cancer treatment and it doesn't have you know, very, very bad side effects. Also, when we are going to do um, shock and kill, you are going to do this for a short period of time. We are not going to you know, do this for a long time. So hopefully, whatever side effects you have will be, will be minimal. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, please? Well, uh, I have we... one more. Yes, please. Question. Let's go ahead, Inkofu. Okay. Yes, I wanted to know if there are any studies uh, targeting the TAT protein, since TAT is known to be very important in um, HIV transcriptional activities. And so are there any studies that try and inhibit um, the function of the TAT protein? Yes, that's a very, very important question. So on the block and lock, if you remember, I mentioned DCA. And DCA actually is a TAT inhibitor that was discovered by um, Susan Valente in Florida. And what was weird about her study is that although this is a TAT inhibitor, it also seemed to affect the HIV chromatin. And so when, they, when you treat the, the, the mice with the TAT inhibitor for a while and you stop, you are still not able to transcribe HIV. So yes, a lot of the block and lock approaches seem to be targeting TAT. The one that we also found, the pseudomycins target a protein called SF3B1, which also interacts with TAT. So now what we are doing in my lab is that we are screening for compounds that will block the SF3B1 TAT interaction because we believe blocking that sl 3 one tat interaction will be able to, if nothing at all, be another treatment for HIV if it is not for, for a cure. So yeah, tat is very important and uh, we are all scrambling to, to target it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'd like to appreciate uh, Dr. Che for this very illuminating lecture, certainly giving us a good idea about viruses and about HIV. The audience in the auditorium at ACM would like to show their appreciation. Can you?
Thank you. Thank you. We'd also like to thank all those who took time to come and join us in learning so much about HIV and the possible cure. Just as we are all looking forward to a cure for COVID, we trust that all these viruses will go and join the pool of dormant retroviruses <laughs> that will not cause us any harm in the future so yeah, that we can yeah. continue to live our lives as we should. Thank you all very much for coming. And the session is over. God bless. We'll have a closing prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you very much for this afternoon and what we've been through. We thank you for the opportunity to expand our knowledge. We pray, Lord, that even as we go to our various places, what we have learned will be galvanized into some innovation, some new technology, some new thoughts that will bring progress and relief to your own people. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you bless the speaker for what he has shared with us so generously. And bless us all as we go on our various ways. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Amen. Amen. Amen.